Hola! It's time for lecture four. Sixteen more to go, and we're done with this semester. So we're going to be learning about surviving, adapting, and evolving. This has to do with a touchy subject for some people, dealing with reproduction, evolution, extinction. So we're going to talk about how that works today. What are our learning objectives? We're going to introduce evolution and natural selection, what it is and what it is not. We'll briefly discuss the various kingdoms of life and describe the process of succession and analyze symbiotic relationships. I love symbiotic relationships. You'll find out why. Conclude with an overall predation versus prey scenario and understand how that applies in the scheme of evolution. Natural selection. I want you to think and jot down while you're taking notes just in the side of your notebook what you think the first thing that comes to mind is natural selection. I bet, let's pause, but I can almost hear your brain vibes spooky, isn't it? I can hear it all the way into this computer right now. And most of you are saying the strongest, the fastest, the bestest, the most fit. Well, that's partially right, but there's more to the story. So we're going to get into that and tell you the rest of the story. What is natural selection? The process in which better adapted individuals those with a combination of genetic traits that are better suited to environmental conditions are more likely to survive and, most importantly, reproduce, increasing their proportion in the population. Quote, unquote, survival of the fittest. Let me emphasize that reproduction part. Sexual fitness is actually a really important part of evolution, and it's a discussion that's not usually held unless you're in a some type of a major's course about evolution, and I think it belongs here. I think we need to talk about that. You can have a wimp of an animal, but it still be able to sexually reproduce. So let's just say we get a convention of all brown roaches in the entire world, and they come to Waco, Texas to go to the magnolia silos, right? And those roaches, let's just say those are people, we could kind of go with that, but my scenario is going to happen where we have this giant meteor that strikes right where the uh, silos are and wipes out every brown roach in the world. Well, we have these green roaches that exist. And the green roaches didn't get invited to the convention at the Magnolia so silos, right? So now the green ones are, their gene pools going to be present. And so they're going to be the sexually fit ones. So you can have big, best, most durable of any creature on earth, but unless they're able to reproduce and keep the reproduction cycle going, they will fizzle out and they will go extinct. Important concept about natural selection. So Charles Darwin, sometimes I think he gets a bad rap and he deserves a really good one. This guy was inquisitive. He had a passion for rocks. That's one reason I like him a lot. But he also liked to travel. That's my second reason for really liking Darwin. And he really took what was out in nature and observed it when he did his voyage on the Beagle. So basically, his concepts of evolution say this. Cumulative genetic changes occurring over time within a population of organisms. And this can be passed from generation to generation. It's also referred to as adaption because it represents an evolutionary modification that improves survival and reproduction success within a population. This may not always be true because a mutation can occur. And, you know, since we've seen all these superhero movies come out with like X-Men and so forth, and they have these awesome mutations, right? Mutants, and they can do cool stuff. Well, not all mutations give you cool stuff. Some of them are bad mutations, like cancer gene mutations. Some of them are absolutely neutral and have 
no bearing on the success of reproduction of an organism. So hopefully over time, like my little roaches that I mentioned, the green ones, all the brown ones were better suited for survival because they blended better into their environment. Well, the green ones now are available, but over time they might get stepped on because they're so visible, which may mean that an evolutionary gene starts to develop a color shift change in roaches. I know it's a, a silly example, but it's just something to bring to light. So evolution concept is credited to Charles Darwin, and because of his work and his writings on his voyage on the Beagle. So this is Brad Turner. I didn't really feel like you'd want to see me, Brad, put his stuff in this, this section of the lecture, and I was fine with it. Brad is a little kid on the left. Brad is a medium kid in the middle. Brad now as an adult, kind of, on the right. I can say that. We're co-authors of the book that you're doing. He's a very good friend of mine. Matter of fact, if you ever get the chance, ask him why he's nicknamed Lucky. And he that's a story in itself. But there is change over time. And as he reproduces, and he has two girls, his genes have been passed on, and so is his wife's, into those children. The success of the Turner family being able to reproduce since he's an only child will depend on if those children are able to reproduce. So in any line of species, that's a critical component of evolution. So let's make some observations. What's wrong with Mr. Smiley evolution over here on the right? Evolution via natural selection occurs in four different specific areas. One, overproduction. Two, variation. Three, limits on the population growth. And four, differential reproductive success. So where could something go wrong in one of those four steps? How could you end up with this scenario? A gene mutation. So let's look at overproduction first. Each species produces more offspring than will survive to sexual maturity in hopes that some will be able to reproduce and carry on the family name or the species line, if you want to look at it that way. Natural populations have the reproductive potential to increase their numbers continuously over time. There's a problem with that, though. There becomes an ecological threshold where you have too many species sharing the same resources in the same area, impossible to sustain over geologic time. Two is variation. Individuals within a population exhibit genetic variation. Now, I'm adopted, but I have a full-blooded sister. So, a full-blooded sister. So, if I put Christy's picture up next to mine, you would go, wow, y'all look so much alike. And we do. She may be eight years younger than I am and so forth, but we share exactly the same DNA from the same two parents. So I have an adopted brother. Thank goodness I don't share his genes, right? Ha ha. I love him. Don't get me wrong. But we don't have any biological relationship. But what we do have is we have environmental relationships in terms of being raised in the same household. Each individual has a unique combination of specific traits, such as their body size, their color, their ability to survive within their respective environments. Some traits improve the chances of an individual's survival and reproductive success, whereas others do not. The variation necessity for evolution by natural selection must be inherited so it can be passed on to the offspring. So you may have seen the person that you would think is the least likely to be uh, producing offspring, and you're like, how did this happen? And you're wondering about that, or you might have seen the most beautiful thing you thought in your eyes, person that you're thinking, why don't they have any children? Well, beauty is only part of it. It's only to the eye of the beholder, and there are many attributes within individual species that attract Mates, for example, the Atwater prairie chicken is an endangered, critically endangered bird for that matter. There's a natural wildlife refuge for them down in South Texas. And if you want to see the funniest thing ever, I mean, 
get rolling laughing funny, find a video clip of male Atwater Prairie chickens trying to find a mate during mating season. And you'll see how they've adapted sexually and physically to try to attract mates to carry on the likelihood of survival of the Atwater Prairie chicken. Kind of a fascinating story. Number three important variation. So Brad lives in an area around Waco, and this is one of the many uh, inhabitants of his property. And so he captured one of them, uh, one of the bunnies on his property, and he used it as an example of limits on population growth. Organisms compete with one another for limited resources available to them within a habitat. So too many bunnies, not enough food resources, you're going to start to see a die off of bunnies naturally without any intervention. Not all of the offspring will survive. That's unfortunate, but it does happen. So if they don't all survive to reproductive age because there are more individuals than the environment can support, then obviously you've had to die off of some of them. Other limits on growth include factors like predators and diseases. In the human realm, we try to intervene with modern medicine to try to keep our offspring alive. Of course, we don't have as many offspring, generally speaking. I guess that's not true in certain parts of the world, but we'll look at that in our next lecture. But let's just say right here in the United States, we don't have as high a birth rate as some other countries do. So we have more resources to provide. And that matters when we're looking at any type of species. Four, differential reproductive success. Those individuals that possess the most favorable combination of all said characteristics for reproduction and are more likely to survive to be able to reproduce and pass their traits on to the next generation will have a higher success in reproduction. Offspring tend to resemble their parents because the next generation obtains their genetic footprint or their parents' traits. The best adapted individuals reproduce most successfully, whereas less fit individuals die prematurely or reproduce uh, fewer or inferior offspring. So again, it's not looks necessarily. It may be in the human realm for some people, and it may not be at all for you. But I'm saying in general, there are certain traits in nature that attract offspring or attract a mate to make offspring. And you're looking for survival techniques and survival attributes. And that's those can be sensed by organisms and the wild. Evolution and biodiversity. Originally, scientists classified species either as plants or animals. That has subsequently changed. As microscopes were developed, scientists discovered new things about biodiversity. Today, there are six kingdoms of life that are classified in three separate domains. Kingdom Archaea is in Domain Archaea. Well, that's the first domain is Domain Archaea. Domain Bacteria has a kingdom called Bacteria. So there are single kingdoms in each of those domains. Domain Eukarya or Eukaryotes is what we're part of. There's four different basic kingdoms. There's protista, there's fungi, there's plantae, and animalia. So if you want to consider where you fall in that, it's the last kingdom. Each one of these is important because these are multicellular animals. So we're going to take a look at how this all fits together and works towards the bigger process. Archaea, this comes from the Greek word archaeo and means ancient. There's no nucleus, lives in an oxygen deficient environment such as a cesspool would be a great example or at the bottom of the ocean where dead stuff is, adapted to very harsh environments and lives in salt palms, ponds, sulfur springs, and along hydrothermal vents, cool stuff, hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean floor at mid-oceanic ridges. These are important guys things that kind of were new to the biology scheme in terms of once we started learning about microscopic organisms. Bacteria has one chromosome, a double-stranded DNA. That's how it differs from archaea. Some bacteria cannot conduct, conduct photosynthesis without 
chloroplast. And antibiotics target particular cell walls when killing bacteria. That's one reason you want to be prudent in taking too many antibiotics so the bacteria does not develop a better defense mechanism that your antibiotic can't kill. So that's why doctors often are hesitant to just to prescribe you an antibiotic when you get yellow mucus because they're like, hmm, you need to really have an infection so we don't overdo the ba uh, bacteria antibiotics and you not be able to fight off an infection that could kill you. So doctors are always trying to look out for you in that realm. Protista, mostly unicellular and relatively simple organisms. And they evolved on their own. Separate from fungi, plants and animals are very unique. This kingdom possesses both heterotrophic and autotrophic characteristics. It's probably the most unique of all in terms of its ability to survive. They mostly live in water and all have a nucleus. Hmm, pretty durable dudes. Fungi break down the organic material trapped in dead things and help recycle and cycle nutrients through various ecosystems. We want them. Most vascular, vascular plants have symbiotic fungi that inhabit their roots and supply essential nutrients like bacteria in our stomachs. So if you didn't have certain coli and other bacteria in your stomach, you would not be able to live. And so that's really important after you've been really sick that you get those back in your tummy so you can break down the food that you eat and you'll produce healthy waste. Fungal diseases are difficult to treat because their cells are genetically and chemically similar to our own. Plantae, all land plants, mosses, ferns, conifers, flowering plants, etc. fall into this category. It's huge. This is a huge kingdom. And, or, uh, and it is a kingdom. But nevertheless, plants are just, they're huge. There's a huge number of them. Second in diversity only to the kingdom Animalia. So they're autotrophs. We talked about them in the last lecture. And let's move on. Let's look at the animalia and talk about animals means Latin for having breath. So a yoga moment, right? Multicellular organisms whose body parts become established as they grow. Most are modal, meaning that they can only move around. And first ever known animal with an exoskeleton was from about 542 million years ago in the Cambrian period, and it was a trilobite. Love trilobites. You need to go check out and Google trilobites. They are the most awesome fossils of index reference in the rock record. So they didn't have a backbone, but they did have an outer tough skeleton-like feature that helps protect their soft body parts inside. Succession, an example of evolution in a forest. The process of a community development over time is what succession really is. And this involves species and one stage being replaced by another more complex species. Certain organisms that initially colonize an area replaced over time by other organisms as the ecosystem evolves. So forest is a place where that happens regularly. It's a constant place of change. Succession is in two ways that we see, whether it's a forest habitat or other, is primary and secondary succession. So let's look at primary first. The change in species composition over time in a previously uninhabited environment. So pioneers, hmm. also known as pioneer communities. Imagine that. And then typically no soil exists when primary succession begins, but will develop over time as secondary succession occurs. So what is secondary succession? The change in species composition that takes place after some disturbance destroys the existing vegetation or when the soil is already present. These happen when later communities are non-pioneers, so they've had time to develop and establish soils. They can be grasses, shrubs, saplings, trees, you name it. So in a forest environment, 
we didn't just have like forest automatically in geologic time. We talked about that in biomes. It happened over a succession of events that led to the formation of soil, ultimately forests that had to be dependent on water and then ones that could germinate outside the presence of water. So it's been a remarkable change over geologic time of the succession, but a succession can happen in our own lifetime even shorter in a forest environment. So let us begin with the picture. When you see the annual weeds on one, years after cultivation, on years two through four, you'll see annual perennial weeds. And then in five to 15 years, you'll see pine seedlings and saplings. 25 to 50 years, you're gonna start to see young pine forest because we've had enough time for cones to drop and germinate and make more trees. And then in 150 years, you'll see a mature forest. So a forest is a great case study for looking at succession. The process of succession has several stages. Stage one is lichens. These are called pioneer communities. They secrete acids, lichens do, that help break up rock. They are enemies of rocks. Plants are enemies of rocks. And then they help form soil. Just had to stick that in there about rocks. Typically, this process requires an immense amount of time to break down hard bedrock with lichens or plants. Stage two, mosses and grasses. Continue the process of creating soil by adding more nutrients retained from precipitation. So as rain falls, there is actually nutrients that have gotten into the rain that can add to, like uh, carbon, for example, that can add into the soil. Also begin to produce light layer of O matter, which is your organically rich top layer of soil, hopefully, that you have uh, for later species. Stage three of succession is when shrubs and limited trees begin to appear. They can grow in a non-fertile soil. They might include some perennial weeds and saplings. As we make it into stage four, the conifer forest, also known as the young pine forest, has poor to fair soil quality. One reason is, is they are not deciduous. They don't drop their leaves. They are perennial. They last year round. A few problems with the old uh, conifer forest involve dot, dot, dot. The fact that they don't drop their leaves like stage five deciduous forest. So sometimes we also call a deciduous forest a mature hardwood forest. Not all deciduous plants enjoy a low acid nutrient rich soil. It takes over a century for prepared land to even complete the process of secondary succession when reverted back to only soil. So after clear cutting, let's apply that to something like rainforest. It'll take at least 150 years to get back to a place where we can start making soil and go through the succession process again. So it's not a quick Fix. That's why selective cutting for forest is a better option. All right, symbiosis. We talked about that at the beginning and objective. Let's talk about why it's so important. An intimate and essential relationship or association between members of two or more species. They have and give something to each other. They're symbiotic. Coevolution: when two interdependent species evolve together. Participants are called symbionts. So there are three types of symbiosis, mutualism, commensalism, and when you have a parasite that attacks something. So what's up with the peanut butter and jelly? I mean, are you really going to have a jelly sandwich without peanut butter? I mean, that's a symbiotic relationship in its own way, right? So let's talk about each one of them. Mutualism or mutual. When different species living in close association provide benefits to one another. So they have a mutual understanding. That's how I like to think of it. Bees and fruit producing plants, ants and plants. They do something for each other. So there's a mutual benefit for both of them uh, interacting together. When you have com uh, commensalism, you actually have an association as two different species in which one benefits and the other is totally unaffected. And the white birds you see on livestock are a case in point. 
basically, I guess you could kind of say there's some benefit. They may pick off the ticks off of the livestock, but livestock don't care. I mean, it's really useless to them. Birds that follow cattle, tree frogs and trees, the frogs aren't doing anything for the trees, but the trees are giving something to the frogs. So there's a benefit one way. That's how you can think of this one. When you're getting into the third type, which is parat uh, parasites, then own one organism, just one, only one and just one, benefits. And it's always the parasite. They obtain nutrients from another organism. Though parasites do weaken their host, only a few rarely will kill them. There's a few that we want to stay clear of, and you should know what some of those are. You always want to be checking for ticks so you don't get Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever or some other type of Lyme's disease. Over 100 different parasitic species live on or where human beings are. And that's just on human beings. It doesn't include other animals. Fleas, bed bugs, ew, bed bugs, yuck. Ticks, I mean, really, yuck to all three, right? But bed bugs, scary stuff. So, um... Think about that when you're traveling abroad. Competition, what does that mean? Competition is when multiple species and individuals compete for the same resource inside a niche. Here we got some deer going after it, right? When there's, they're fighting over competition, probably for mating. When there is competition for limited resource, one organism or species will always win control over the resource. If it's food, they're gonna fight to the death for the food because they need it. Common concept when applied to humans as well. Niche terms, habitat, the local environment in which an organism lives. An ecological niche means the totality of an organism's adaptions, its use of its resources and the lifestyle in which it is fitted to live. Fundamental niche, this is our ideal niche. It's the one we would like to have the ecosystem representing it's like the fairyland, what it should be. It's the what we're hoping it will be. A realized niche, however, is the actual resources that are found in the species and how it uses its resources within a niche. So there's a big difference between fundamental niche and realized niche because what we're hoping for an ecosystem reference, the best ecosystem ever, that's usually not the case. I will tell you, when I used to work for the Brazos River Authority, we used eco-reference streams. And those were considered the best water, water quality streams of a region. And you compared the water quality of all the subsequent streams in the area to that one as a sense of comparison. It was your fundamental niche or your what we were hoping everybody else would be. But as we did our water sampling, we found the realized niche was not so hot and we had problems in places like the North Bosque River. So more to come on that later. More niche terms, species richness. This is the number of species in a community and edge effect. What's that? It's the odd combinations of species, interactions, and transition zones. So maybe you're in the taiga borderlining the permafrost, and it's that transition area, the edge effect. Ecosystem services, environmental benefits that natural ecosystems provide for cohabitants and adjacent peoples. Community stability, the ability of a community with, to withstand environmental disturbances. And if you don't have stability, it's a sure thing. If problems come your way or an imbalance, something's going to go wrong and the ecosystem's likely to fail. Niche terms continued, limiting resource, any environmental resource that because it is scarce or unfavorable levels, and meaning at that unfavorable levels, restricts the ecological niche of an organism. So it restricts its ability to survive, really. Resource partitioning, this coexisting species niches differ from each other in one or more ways, such as water, maybe it's the availability or the quality of the water, seeds, soil, etc. Keystone species. I love this term, keystone species. Sea otters are keystone species. We'll talk about them in endangered species. A species that often exerts a profound influence on a community in excess of ex that expected simply because of its abundance. 
So we'll learn more about what sea urchins do. For now, you could Google and see what their role in the environment is and what they eat. And when you find out what they eat, then you gotta figure out what that thing they're eating does for the environment in which it lives. So that's what a keystone species does. It helps control and keep things in check. Strategies for competition. Plant defenses. Plants compete with each other and other plant species to avoid being consumed by heterotrophs. What are some ways they might do that? Waxy leaves, thorny leaves, narcotic ingredients, all of which are real. Spices, bitterness, some have stinging options. I mean, think about poison ivy, poison oak. Think about, uh, there's a plant called creosote. Oh, here's some peppers there. Man, this just kind of deters you from eating something that would be like that if you were an animal. So if I were to give my uh, neighbor donkey one of those, Sally, she wouldn't like the pepper. She'd spit it out, but she'll eat the carrots all day long. But the plants can have defensive mechanisms to try to help them survive and not be consumed. Prey defense, camouflage, you know this. They mimic other things. They look like something else or they mimic a leaf. Like you can see this is a camouflage and mimicking. They may have a strong speed or are being very agile to move quickly and make sharp turns. They can have overpopulation, spikes, shells, thick skin, poison, venom. All of these are prey defense to try to keep alive is basically what that means. Predator tools. They also camouflage. They also have speed. They have teeth and usually sharp ones. Balance and excellent vision. Uh, cats would be a great example. At night, cats are all about night vision, and they have some remarkable eyes that allow them to see in the dark very well. Intelligence, poisons, or venoms, they might actually have that. For example, a rattlesnake. Webs and claws, so they have things to try to grasp or get or obtain their prey. Science servings, you know what that means. Yay! Wolves are the most widespread land predator. The only places where they do not thrive are in the deserts and tropical rainforest. It is believed that the last wolf was killed in England about 15,000 CE. The biosphere is believed to be 3.8 billion, that's with a B, billion years old. Commensalism, Demodex brevis in your eyelashes. Look into that and see what you think about that. So as we conclude our lecture, think about the goals of how you're going to survive. It's best to avoid standing directly between a competitive jerk and his goals. So when it comes to adapting and evolution, nature finds a way. It always does. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you in Lecture 5. See you then. Bye.